Why hasn't Wizards of the Coast made a better alchemy and crafting system for D&D 5th edition? Is it too hard? Does it not make enough money? If Wizards of the Coast isn't going to do it, it's up to third party publishers to do it for us. Today I bring you the Alchemy Almanac by Heavy Arms. You may already know Heavy Arms from his Gunslinger class and his Armorer's Handbook, both very popular works that you may have seen on the DMs Guild before. Now he has a website of his own, and he reached out to me and said, hey, you seem to like alchemy stuff. Do you want to look at the Alchemy Almanac? And I said, yep. So Heavy Arms got me a copy of his PDF for the Alchemy Almanac. I've gone through it very meticulously and taken many notes that I will share with you today. First, I want to go over the kind of mission statements for why this settlement was created. It's important to look at third-party publishers' mindsets, goals, assumptions, and their design philosophies when you look at their work. It's become apparent to me that it's really important to know if you are the target audience and who they made the work for. Here's who this supplement is made for. If you're looking for plug-and-play crafting rules that put no extra work on the Dungeon Master, a fun and interactive money sink for players, recipes for hundreds of potions, new and old, with unlimited capacity for additional recipes and ingredients, rules for buying and selling including price lists, and rules for dynamically populating shop inventory with a single dice roll, and no arbitrary time or level gating for the crafting, then you're in the right place and this is the product for you. I fit into that target demographic, and I'll show you why this product is my new alchemy, herbalism, monster harvesting system. Many have said that players have a hard time spending their gold in 5th edition, so this is a great way for you to give them the reins and say, do you want to do this? This is a great way to spend your gold. So the PDF is 53 pages, full color interactive PDF with bookmarks and hyperlinks. Now 53 pages might sound like a lot, but the actual rules in this PDF are a fairly brief part of it. So don't be put off by 53 pages because that will mislead you. It's actually very manageable. So looking at the table of contents, here's what we're going to get in this supplement. How to run the game with it, which is very brief. Fieldcraft, which is harvesting creatures and gathering plants. Herbalism, for making medicine, and this is one of the highlights for me. Actual alchemy, for potion craft and the different items and their descriptions. The guild, how to join it and how to, let's say, level up and advance in it. And then there are player options. There are subclasses for cleric, druid, and wizard. There are eldritch invocations and there are artificer infusions, as well as feats and new magic items. And then we have a bunch of tables for reference for terrain that you can harvest from, plants and fungi of the realms, creature loot, recipe index, guild stocks for stocking shops and whatnot, success tables, an inventory sheet to help you track all the inventory in this because most players don't like tracking and so we're trying to make it as seamless as possible for players to track within the system, track inventory and what they have to craft and what they've crafted, I mean. And then design notes and frequently asked questions. So I use highlighting in this PDF so that my eye can be immediately drawn to the points that matter most. Sometimes if it's in purple, it means it's something really powerful and I really like it. If it's red, it means it's probably a limitation or a problem. Yellow and green is usually just like, this is how it works. So this was mentioned in the target audience bullet points, but there is no level gating to this supplement. So anyone of any level can attempt anything in here. There are some things that you'll have no chance of succeeding just because of the way modifiers work and there's certain numbers you'll never roll, but there isn't a rule like, oh, you must be level five to attempt this. There are rules for how much you must have advanced through the guild and what rank you have attained. If you've used one of Heavy Arms supplements before, you know that he uses a burning condition, which is pretty much you set something on fire and it's just a very easy way to sum it up. They're taking fire damage over time until they're put out pretty much like an alchemist fire. And then there's an extended rest, which is mostly just to stop you from using the same powerful potion day after day. There are some potions that you can only benefit from once a week. All right, so fieldcraft. First of all, I like that Heavy came up with this shorthand for when a DC increases when you repeat it. So for example, if you're trying to gather components by rolling on the common flora table here, to try to find components for your crafting. The first DC is 10, and then if you try to do it again in that instance, it goes up plus five. So it's 10 slash plus five. So it goes 10, 15, 20, and so on. It gets more difficult, but if you can hit those numbers, you can get more done in less time. So there is one point where the GM needs to decide what kind of terrain or environment you are in. You do not want to spend too much time in urban environments. So if you are playing in a campaign that is primarily urban, this supplement will need to be tweaked somewhat or save this supplement for when you're not gonna be in a city all the time. There are also mechanics like if you're a ranger with favored terrain, you get a bonus. 
to your gathering process. In all the crafting rules in this supplement, you can't use temporary modifiers like a bardic inspiration to help you with these rolls. So there's a lot of things that normally you could use for skill checks that will not apply to the skill checks involved with your field craft. I did clarify with heavy arms that some abilities like portent can be used on your field craft, but it's just anything that's a temporary modifier is not going to work. If your friends in the party are helping you, then you can roll with advantage, just like the help action usually, as long as they help you the whole time. And then there are some spells and whatnot, and other abilities, or even some summoned creatures, some monsters, who if you have them helping you, you get certain bonuses. And I like this kind of attention to detail to the big picture of the game, and how what exists is enhanced by this supplement. That's a good sign of good design, that's why I like this so much. There's a harvesting kit that is introduced here to help you harvest from monsters. You can harvest from monsters that are incapacitated, so you don't have to kill them all. You could perform surgery. And there is this wording here to kind of make it so not just everyone can attempt this role. You need to actually be proficient with the harvesting kit to try to harvest from monsters in this way. And the harvesting rules tend to do that in all parts of this book. So it's not like you can just have a party of six people and they all roll and someone's going to get it, right? It needs to be that someone's invested in having a proficiency with the harvesting kit to attempt this. Time frames are given for how long it takes to attempt these, the DCs. And I like that the DCs for this are based on strength or dexterity because it's difficult to harvest from a monster in contrast to the like wisdom and intelligence that will be used for some of the other harvesting rules. All of a sudden the fighter can become an alchemist as well because they can use the harvesting kit well with their strength for example i think this makes the battle master stronger because i think the battle master gets proficiency in a tool of their choice right so they could choose the harvesting kit and there is a caveat here that the gm decides if any components of a target monster would normally be there but maybe were damaged in a fight so this might sound like it's the dm saying oh you couldn't get the ingredient you want which would be sad but instead it actually enables the gm to say yeah you can kill this monster pretty easily but can you do it without harming its eyes or its liver or whatever Whatever part of it you need so it adds a secondary goal to the combat you don't just want to win you want to win quickly and strategically so that you don't harm the components you're hoping to harvest and if you didn't notice this system is convincing players to not just make strength their dump stat or at least have a good enough dexterity because if they want to harvest some of those monster parts they really want to have good modifiers for it so they can succeed there are some monsters you only see once in a campaign and if you miss the chance oh well now that we've gone over how to harvest flora and harvest monsters, let's get into herbalism or herbalism for the rest of the world who doesn't say herbalism. Though this supplement is named for being about alchemy, the herbalism and monster crafting into medicines is my favorite part of this supplement. First, there are medicine categories with a main primary component and that component is associated with a certain type of medicine you can create. And then there are secondary components that can be used to enhance whatever you're trying to craft. So if you were expecting just a laundry list of like a hundred different primary components to say, oh, this is what makes that thing. No, this is kept pretty simple of having primary components that generally are used for a certain category of medicine crafting. And then there are secondary components to enhance whatever you're trying to craft or that may be required depending on what you are trying to make. There are gold costs associated with these. And in order to succeed, there are going to be DC checks of to see if you even succeed in your crafting. So you have to succeed at getting the right ingredients, which may require rolls or smart thinking, and then you still might fail. So be ready to sometimes be disappointed if things don't work out, but usually if you play your cards right, you're gonna do just fine with this. It takes an hour to make a medicine, so no more like week of downtime or anything like that. We're going off intelligence or wisdom modifier for this one. And then this is something I love. There's a strength of the medicine using this five star system and a rising DC depending on where you are. Now keep in mind this maximum level with a little bit of luck can be achieved just at level one. It's not likely, but there are ways to do it. Again, there's no level gating. You could potentially maximum craft something at level one though there is a certain type of crafting in medicine that is gated behind your guild rank which is if there is this four pointed star so there's usually the five star system with five stars like a five point star the usual but there's a four point star like a diamond that denotes that once you get to that level of enhancement it becomes permanent the effect becomes permanent. You can only have one medicine giving you a permanent effect at a time, so you can't just stack them all on. But once you get to that, some of these become really good. And so if you look down here, it's really easy to see, okay, what is the default maximum strength of a potion? So you know how hard it is to craft and how strong it probably is. And then the empty stars represent how much it can be upgraded. And then if there is a four point star, that means master guild members can make its effect permanent. Some items here like draft of giant strength isn't upgradable as much as you just craft it at different levels. That's 
that's illustrated here by the dash mark, the hyphen between the range that it can be. And these are all placed in their medicinal categories, curative, augmenting, fortifying, restorative, and special. And then I also love that Heavy Arms included this, enhancing medicines. Instead of having to put this same text on every single medicine type description, he just said, okay, here is how upgrading works. You're either upgrading duration or potency. If you're upgrading potency, then it's multiplicative and it becomes like 1d8 to 2d8 to 4d8 to 8d8. You double the dice. That's how it's enhanced. If it's duration, there are increments. And I totally agree with this because this is something I believe Wizards of the Coast got wrong when they made the Sorcerer meta magic for extended spell. They just made it so you, you arbitrarily make it a little bit longer. It should be in the increments that spells typically go. And this does that. So if it's a one minute medicine, it becomes 10 minutes. 10 minutes becomes an hour. An hour becomes eight hours and eight hours becomes 24 hours. So that's how it works cumulatively. I totally back this. Let's go through some of these medicines you can make. I highlighted a few of my favorites. Archer's Gum, a creature that consumes it gains the benefit of the sharpshooter feat for one hour. You get a feat for one hour? And then let's practice here. So right now it requires a three star strength difficulty. So there's gonna be a certain chance of success or failure and you can enhance it up to once. And if you enhance it once, we just learned that one hour becomes eight hours. So if you have enough Archer's Gum, you could potentially make it so someone doesn't have to take the sharpshooter feat. They could just take some of this medicine to enhance their aim when they need it. Here's one that's pretty crazy that's not even a five star, but you need a Coatl Eye or Metallic Dragon Eye. So sometimes it's the components that make this difficult to make. When you drink Shape Change Tincture, you gain the effect of a Shape Change spell, ninth level spell for one hour, no concentration required, hot dog. Oh, but you can only assume beast or humanoid forms. Okay, it's a little bit limited and that makes more sense why it's only a four star. So yeah, read these all carefully because sometimes you'll be like what oh okay it's kind of rained in yep cool and i like all of these medicines i'm just highlighting the ones that i took note of so that i can show you them quickly and not make a two hour long review where i go through each of these dark vision some true sight mage hand and some telekinetic abilities with exhaustion reading thoughts recover from disease prepare more spells than you usually could marco's miracle bomb you need snake oil i love that <laughs> because what's it going to do? It reduces your physical age by 1d6 plus 6 years. So I love this because that's just so snake oil salesman to be like, I'll make you younger. This will make you younger. Drink it. That's snake oil salesman. So that, that's just a funny joke. Have an ashes mana wall that requiring Rakshasa blood allowing you to be unaffected by spells of six level or lower until you choose to be <laughs> very cool. Hero's Elixir, five stars. When you fail a saving throw, you can choose to succeed instead. So you get legendary resistance up to three times per long rest. Lionheart T can become permanent, can't be charmed or frightened. You can gain magic resistance, but then you also won't be able to cast spells or concentrate on them with the tincture of magic resistance. Troll Ungent, for 10 minutes, you regain 10 hit points at the start of each of your turns. So you get a troll's regeneration, pretty cool. Keep in mind that numbers like the 10 hit points do not become multiplicative when you're upgrading. It's only if there's a dice roll involved that you would double it when you're enhancing it. So you're only enhancing the 10 minutes here. So the 10 minute goes to an hour and then to eight hours at its maximum level. So you can have eight hours of 10 hit point per turn regeneration. Okay, and then we've got Ambrosia. If you have a unicorn horn, good luck getting that. A non-evil creature that drinks Ambrosia is granted a wish as if they had cast the wish spell. An evil creature that drinks it is destroyed. <laughs> Very straight up. So here's the thing. If you get a unicorn horn, that might make you evil because of how pure it is. You know, Voldemort style, like only the most vile creature would kill a unicorn. Paradoxically, someone else needs to get you the unicorn and you need to not be evil. So if you convince someone to get you the unicorn horn, that probably makes you evil. And if you get it yourself, you're evil. So this thing will destroy you. So how do you get it? You have to come by it completely innocently. Who decides? The GM does. So be careful. All right, now let's get into the actual alchemy system. I like this bit of flavor text in the alchemy section that implies someone who is wise will feel safer with an antidote in their pocket, but not trust others to make it. However, a curious mind is the most important catalyst. That just feels right for an alchemist. This alchemy system requires magical reagents and an alchemical base. So here are the different bases, activated charcoal, flash powder, etc all the way down to white phosphorus. These things themselves don't have a mechanical value. It's all flavor and they are described later on, but you get a brief description here. So here are the bases and their availability. So alcohols, you got the fine spirits and even a rectified spirit. And the availability goes from general to limited to specialist. And this is based on 
apothecary's availability if you want to purchase these things. So these alchemical bases do need to be acquired from apothecaries, so the gold costs are associated with purchasing. And then it's the reagents, the second part of the crafting, that you roll on a table to see what you get as long as you're in a place that is conducive to getting that. So if you're in a place with no water, there might not be a chance of you getting water essence. And this goes back to the field craft rules because there's a point where you can choose to roll on the common flora table or try to find more or try to find rarer flora but you can also choose to roll instead for reagents if you're not looking for flora at the time so these rules kind of all feed into each other and you'll see later in the tables how you can get them but they are earth fire wind water ice and lightning as the different reagents again it takes an hour of uninterrupted work and this time you can only use your intelligence modifier as a bonus again we're using the five star system but this one is just for difficulty unlike medicines there's not an upgrade system for the potions that you can make the alchemical items they're all very straightforward in what level of strength and difficulty they are to craft and you don't need to worry about the upgrading system but i love the upgrading system in medicine that's why it's my favorite part of this supplement there's also rules here for a spell storing potion which is kind of like making a spell scroll there's certain requirements here for what kind of spells you can put in based on their casting time and their range who it affects you need to use a spell slot who it can affect how long it lasts all that sort of stuff so this is a cool little supplement here for the difficulty of just making a potion that is a spell effect and what it takes to store that spell successfully in the potion. This covers a lot of ground because you don't have to now make a potion for every single spell. It's just all covered right here. There's an optional rule for side effects as well, which can be, go from anything to nothing to you explode. And this is based on if you were close to succeeding on your alchemy roll, but you were like three or less off of what you needed to roll, you can instead choose to still succeed, but there's a chance that there's an unintended side effect when you drink the potion or use the alchemical item. Item that could go really poorly for you so so you need to decide how much you're willing to take a risk if you didn't quite craft as well as you needed to I mean this whole supplement is optional rules but this is an especially optional rule that isn't for everybody so looking here at the items there's the usual stuff like the adventuring gear you know we've got dynamite antitoxin alchemist fire acid the usual stuff got different oils magic items and the usual potions but there will be new ones as well like potion of wizard's bane that's a new one and a philosopher's stone Ooh. All right, let's go through some of the alchemical items to see which ones stood out to me. There's a bunch here, like a choking cinder bomb to lightly obscure an area and poison people. It's flammable, so they start burning. Lots of effects going on there. A flash pellet. You need flash powder from your apothecary, and then you need to have successfully gathered uh, lightning and fire essence. You can blind someone, and anyone with sunlight sensitivity has disadvantage. That's cool. Just like the very bright light really gives a hard time to creatures that normally have a hard time with sunlight. Then we've got some oils here. You can create magical darkness with this. This one the ones that are in the srd the that are already part of the game are marked here as well with srd so you know which ones they are levitation keen edge invisibility oil of sharpness that's another one that's already in the game oil of slipperiness as well potions this one requires a philosopher's stone what is that an elixir of life five star difficulty you need a rectified spirit which i think is a 200 dollars apothecary purchase and five different essences so it's a pretty expensive one to make after you already needed a philosopher's stone removes exhaustion cures disease or poison you stop aging and you're immune to any effect that would age you and you can no longer die from old age. So that sounds pretty good. It's immortality. Wow. If the potion doesn't have a duration like that, then it lasts forever. So you just become immortal. But the Philosopher's Stone, obviously, let's see what that takes to make one of those in a minute. Foe Hammer. That's This one looks pretty intense too. Five stars. You make one additional attack as part of the attack action. Wow. And when you deal damage with melee attacks using your strength, you gain temporary hit points equal to the damage dealt. Wow. If you're dealing like 30 damage with an attack, you gain 30 temporary hit points each turn lasts for one hour let's see this one's got wild magic surge so i'm not super into that immune to being frightened for a little while potion of minor restoration you gain a short rest but you gain a level of exhaustion that's quite the trade-off very cool i like items with a trade-off it really balances it out if it seems too powerful it's like well this also happens Ooh, potion of wizard's bane when you drink this potion you gain the effect of an anti-magic field spell for one minute with no concentration required wow that's amazing it's only four stars i guess five stars is a pretty high bar oh stafford's boon here's a five star when you drink this potion you gain the benefits of an epic boon the gm chooses the boon and it lasts until you drink this potion again so it's permanent until you drink this again so if you get a boon you don't like you could craft it again and re-roll i guess wondrous items so most of these are srd but the philosopher's stone let's look at that five stars you need all six 
reagents, a rectified spirit, and you need to be able to expend a ninth level spell slot. So you gotta be at least level 17 to craft this because you need to expend the spell slot and you need to be a spellcaster. It gives you the ability to transmute base metals into gold and if ground into powder, it can be mixed with one cubic foot of metal or metal alloy while that metal is in a liquid state. On cooling, the metal is magically transmuted into gold. And there's a note here, a cubic foot of solid gold is equivalent in weight to approximately 60,300 standard gold pieces. So you could get rich, not like crazy rich though, but get a lot of money making a philosopher's stone and just using it to make gold. Or you could go back to the elixir of life and gain immortality. Why not both? All right, let's get to the Arcanum, the guild. So here we have some basic notes, how it feeds into the Complete Armorer's Handbook, for example, with a hyperlink. Purchased that one a few years ago, so I've been a fan for a long time. Uh, your guild exams and your guild rank, from novice, seeker, to seer, speaker, master. So those are the different ranks. To gain these ranks, you need to successfully participate in a test and make an item of the difficulty that is prescribed. So it goes from two to three to four to five star. You can focus on potion if you're doing alchemy or medicine if you're doing herbalism and monster parts. There's a guild tuition so in order to take your tuition term you need to do the downtime and the cost so there is still work weeks and gold cost involved in this crafting system but it's a one-time thing just to do your tuition to learn it and once you do then you're off on your own crafting all you want in hour increments instead of days weeks years one time work week i think this is really smart i like that heavy arms didn't just throw out that it can take a while to learn these things all right so as you're leveling up you do get some benefits that kind of get spread around get a plus one bonus to one thing and then a plus one bonus to something else so it's not going to go beyond a plus one bonus to anything you just kind of earn your different plus ones based on if you're going alchemy or medica medicine so like if you're a master alchemist you get a plus one bonus to crafting maximum strength alchemical items the five star ones and you get an arcanist medallion Ooh, so you get a magic item first of all you do need to attune to it but it doesn't count towards the maximum number of magical items you can be attuned to so it doesn't work against you but it does have that gatekeeping that no one can just pick it up and use it you have to attune to it so master alchemist can create spell storing potions using spells of sixth level and seventh level master physique you can create medicines with an indefinite duration like I mentioned earlier and then there's the guild merchants you can buy craft components the higher an items stock score the less likely it will be available and they can only stock what is determined by their guild rank and a member of the guild can roll a stock die and the size of which is determined by their guild rank so you so you get more access to things as you grow in rank you get better chances of finding them at different guild merchants so based on what your rank is this is what you roll to see what components are in stock stocks are replenished daily at dawn you can also buy finished items any character can purchase finished items from a guild merchant though there is a cap on how much you can buy in bulk based on your proficiency bonus and you do need to be in good standing with the guild so don't tick them off you can also try to sell to merchants there's rules here for that there are also rules for downtime activities for how you can do communal work studying or guild work and complications rivals and benefits that come from that you can also do research and research projects so there are ways to enable the dm to work with you on creating new items to craft so this system actually kind of works softly like mcdm's strongholds and followers there was research involved there are other ways to involve research in the game that doesn't involve that book and having a stronghold like it could just be your part of a network all right in chapter five player options so there's the artifice domain cleric which is like a cleric with a little taste of artificer you get artisan's tools and you add your cleric level to your artificer level for the purpose of meeting the level of prerequisites of artificer infusions. This type of cleric can use better infusions as they level up just like an artificer could because they treat their cleric levels as artificers just for the sake of infusion level requirements. So you get infusions that, like an artificer would and at certain levels you do get access to a few more of them but then you are also a cleric. You're not an artificer so you just gain those benefits of making magic items. And then your channel divinity at level 6 is that you can add your proficiency bonus double to an ability check that you make that uses the presented tool. So if you're using a tool that's relevant to your field craft, you can make it much easier with greater chance of success when you roll to harvest or something like that to gather. Circle of the Grove is a druid subclass that doubles down on nature. Entangle, spike growth, plant growth, grasping vine, wrath of nature, druid grove, all those make sense. You get wild growth at second level. You can expend your wild shape to cast one of your circle spells without expending a spell slot. So these circle spells you can cast without spell slots with wild shape. If you cast plant growth in this way, the casting time of the longer version of the spell becomes 
becomes one minute, so you can make the land very fertile very quickly. Briarheart. You can move through plants without being slowed or harmed by them. You can expend a spell slot as a bonus action to teleport to an unoccupied space that you can see within the spell's area while in an area of magical plants. So if you create plant growth, spike growth, or anything like that, you basically can bonus action teleport to anywhere else in that area. Very cool. Harmony at 10th level. When you cast a circle spell that normally requires concentration and a spell slot, you can expend a use of your wild shape feature at the same time to cast the spell without needing to concentrate on it. It lasts for the full duration if you do this. You can do it once per short or long rest. These are great abilities. I like them. And then Grove Guardian. You can transform into a treant. Wow. As a bonus action using your wild shape. <laughs> That's amazing. So this druid kind of stands on its own as having some really cool nature abilities while also doubling down on nature and being more specialized towards herbalism. And then School of Potion Craft for wizards. Alchemist supplies, proficiency doubled. Yes. Thank you. You can drink a bonus as a bo you can drink a potion as a bonus action. That's one of my least favorite house rules, so I like having it be a subclass feature. That's great. Craft attempts you make using alchemist supplies that require an alchemical base require only half the normal amount. All right, so you're better at crafting more efficiently. At sixth level, when you fail a craft check to create a potion, you can use your reaction to expend a spell slot to add half the expended spell slot's level to the result of the check. So if you were just barely off, you know what level of spell slot you need to expend so that you can succeed. And it's rounded up, so like a third level spell slot would get you a plus two, fifth level would get you plus three. Very useful to make sure you succeed and you don't waste those hard earned alchemy ingredients. It's only for potions though, so it's not for the medicines. You gain a heightened tolerance, so you have advantage on saving throws against spells and such that make you blind, charmed, deafened, frightened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. Double dose, you can drink two potions using the same bonus action. Oh, chug, chug, chug. And then if you do use the house rule that you can already drink a potion as a bonus action, the potion wizard's practiced hand feature instead reads, you can drink a potion as part of your move or part of your action. So again, Heavy Arms anticipates that there's a popular house rule that would make that ability redundant, so there is a contingency for what that ability looks like in the event that you use that house rule. I won't go into all these feats and Eldridge invocations, but they are cool. I like them. I won't go through these magic items either, but they are evocative and cool, and they help you with your alchemy, herbalism, and harvesting from creatures. So these are great. All right, finally, the tables at the end. So we got the terrain tables for what you can roll in different terrain areas, the essences of what you can roll if you're rolling to see what essence you get and what's compatible with that area. Common flora, same thing. What kind of flora are you going to get? Plants and fungi of the realm. So these are descriptions helping you bring these items to life. And they're not just names on a page, but like what actually are they? What do they look like? Creature loot. Here are the different creatures that are involved in your medicine crafting in this supplement. So you can quickly see, okay, what are all the creatures that you want to try to put in front of your players so they can find these different ingredients, what they will get out of it, the difficulty rating here. This is fantastic. So this is one I recommend the DM read so they can see what kind of monsters the players are going to be interested in. Recipe index, so you can see all the different strengths of everything that you can craft based on your medicine, alchemical items. And then we have the guild stocks of what's in stock. And here we have unicorn horn. So... <laughs> If you get a stock score of 12, you could buy a unicorn horn for 10,000 gold. This is interesting because you don't have to convince someone to kill a unicorn. Could you? Are you doing it innocently if you pay for it? Does capitalism make you the perpetrator? You ask your DM on that one. You don't want to become evil and drink that potion though and try to make a wish because you will be blown up. So plants, creature parts, and alchemy items are part of what the guild can stock. They're also finished stock items, so you can straight up buy ambrosia. But wait, what's this? POA. Price on application. Some items with special requirements or exotic components have no fixed price and availability may be limited or subject to a waiting list. Yep, so basically the GM can choose to not just have you buy a wish medicine all the time. Yeah, going through these, these all make sense. It's good to have all these resources that you can quickly reference, like, oh, what are the most expensive things? You know, let's look for the biggest ones. Stafford's Boon, five stars, 5,000 gold. Wow. Wow, a lot of price on application here. These must be good. The spell storing items. Oh, that's probably because they could be many different things. So there's success tables. So in order to roll a DC 28 uh, expert roll, first of all, you're still only rolling a D20. So you need at least a plus eight to have a 5% chance of success. And so if you have a plus eight at level one, you could have a 5% chance to craft an expert level medicine or something like that. If you have advantage from a group help check, it becomes 10%. But yeah, this is how it scales just so you kind of know the probabilities and you can weigh risk reward with this kind of crafting. The inventory sheets here, if someone's using the PDF, it's fillable. You can write in this PDF. And then if you want a printer friendly version without all the lines and stuff, just plain text, no coloring per line. Here's that version, the open game license there. And then just design notes of what 
what went into this. So clarifications on what can help you with your gathering rules have been placed here. So here are things that can help you with your rolls that aren't counted as temporary modifiers. So the Pact of the Talisman modifies the outcomes after it has been determined, so it can apply, and any effect that replaces the roll before it is made, such as School of Divination's portent feature also works. So yeah, a lot of rules clarifications here. And then the design notes is that money as motivation. One of the biggest problems a GM faces is finding an intrinsic motivation for players that doesn't involve handing out magic items. So with this system, gold becomes valuable to them as well as finding other parts and items that they can use for their crafting. And that's showing them the fruits of their labors so the GM and the player collectively have more fun and the player is more motivated by money and other carrot on a stick methods the GM can put out. So that's the Alchemy Almanac by Heavy Arms. I highly recommend it. If you want clarifications on how it works, I find it to be very simple once I read it through and just kind of left some notes and made sure I understood it. The only part that I was lost on for a second was the reagents in Alchemy, but then I realized that it was part of the table that was part of the field work two chapters before, and so then it, it made sense. I believe Heavy Arms did succeed in making this a very light lift for DMs that doesn't just overwhelm them with a whole nother system to learn. It really is on the players, and I want more supplements like this that are on the players because there are some very motivated players who will use this sort of stuff. There are players who want to reach high levels in a game normally who don't get to because, for example, a lot of games seem to end before high level play because it puts more burden on DMs and players don't really pick up the slack to start becoming influential in the land and start really thinking how they can affect the world. They kind of keep that level one mindset and so they don't progress and help the DM so the DM ends up ending things instead of becoming a progressive campaign that can last years with many characters and everything. So that's one pitfall that usually uh, befalls groups is that players don't pick up the slack. So supplements like this for players who really want to pick up that slack and get a more rich game experience without taxing the DM or bugging them all the time, this is perfect. There is some reading comprehension to get used to, there is a learning curve, but it's one of those things that you just gotta read it maybe a few times and you just kinda get a big picture of like, okay, if I wanna craft this, here's what I need to do. It's gonna involve the harvesting and then the crafting and then I've got it. There's a guild involved, there's player options, do I want any of those? The guild's great, I wanna level up in that. So the DM probably will want to make the guild some sort of role in their world, and so that's gonna be a thing, but it doesn't need to be high magic kind of guild. It could be a bunch of ragtag alchemists who are just trying to do their best and stay alive and not lose a couple fingers. The Alchemy Almanac is currently available for $17.95 US dollars, which I consider to be a bargain for all the content that is in here. It takes a lot of work to make a system like this, this is why few attempt it, and Wizards of the Coast certainly hasn't. No offense to them, they've got their own reasons, but I'm glad that others are trying and that Heavy Arms took a crack at this. And I know that Heavy Arms worked on this for years because he also mentioned Reddit posts years ago and even seeing mine and Opal's work where we gave our Herbalist field guide with lots of links to different supplements like this. And now this feels like it kind of brought all those things into one place for me and really simplified it to a, a way that I can actually implement it simply. And most of all, this feels like a complete product. It doesn't feel like Heavy is going to say, oh, well, just let your DM, your GM make a ruling about this and that. He really tried to cover his bases and figure out how this fits into the game. It's not half-hearted at all. I will put a link to the product below if you want to go check it out and purchase it. And I will also link to my review that is written out for this supplement. Though in this case, I think the video that I, you've just watched was more detailed than my article, which is rare. And I hope you enjoy it. Let me know if you purchase it, because I'd love to know that I helped people find this amazing supplement. I hope you'll check out more third-party content. There's a lot of real professionals in the space. Third-party content is not just a bunch of homebrew, wasteland, horrible stuff like on D&D Beyond and like D&D Wiki and those sorts of places. There's some really good stuff if you just know where to start. So if you're looking for some recommendations, ask me about it. If you want more Alchemist content, check out my review. I'll put a card up here or something to Terran Pounds, Instructo Boys, Alchemist class that he made. I was a real fan of that as well. So we've got a lot of alchemy options all of a sudden for all characters with the Alchemy Almanac. And if you want to be a specialized alchemist class, as well as the Alchemy Almanac subclasses to specialize in alchemy. This, it's fantastic. I feel like a big chunk of the game that was missing in my heart is now filled. But I'll stop rambling and just wish you a happy foraging this weekend, and I'll see you in the next video.